Hello again, everyone, and happy holidays. It is 8 o'clock a.m. Chicago time on Wednesday, December 13th, 2023. I'm John Kosar from Asbury Research, and this is your Daily Five. These are currently my five most important charts, data series, and Asbury Research quantitative models that I believe are the most important to be aware of and potentially the most influential to U.S. stock market direction over the next several weeks to the next several months, potentially stretching into the mid part of the first quarter of 2024. Let's begin with a brief recap from our previous two year daily five videos that were on October 10th and November 13th to get a sense of where we were back then and what has happened since then. Uh, the title of my October 10th year daily five was major buying opportunity in the US stock market. The S&P 500 was trading at 43.58 on that date and has since risen by 286 points or 7%. In my next year daily five on November the 13th, I said that a rise of about 44.14 in the S&P 500 would clear the way for a test of 46.07 and that the 10 year pulling back from the 5% area, that's the yield of the US 10 year treasury note, pulling back from 5% was going to be positive for equities. Since then, the S&P 500 has risen by 232 points or 5%. So here we are situated just above 4,600 in the S&P 500, which is a major overhead resistance level and a major decision point for the broad market. As I said, when the S&P 500 was situated at 4,200 on October the 10th, I view these big important technical levels as special opportunities. As long as you can figure out which tactical tools to use to find the next strategic trend before the rest of the market does. So with that out of the way, let's now look forward and follow the money. Slide number one, uh, the S&P 500 testing formidable overhead resistance at 4,600. So here we have a daily chart of the S&P 500 going back to all the way back to July of 2021. The reason that I went back so far is I wanted to highlight this level here, 48.19. That was the all-time high that was set in early January of 2022. Um, more important right now is trying to get through the current resistance level, which is 46.07 to 46.37. The former is the high that we made on July the 27th, and the latter, 46.37, is the March 2022 high. That's a major resistance level. Generally speaking, these big important levels don't get broken on the first try. There usually needs to be some backing and filling. And that's really what we're looking for here. We're looking for that for some additional reasons that we're going to get to in just a few moments. But this is the area uh, to really be concerned with 4607 to 4637. As I look up, the S&P is currently trading at 46.50, edging through there a little bit, but not by enough yet that I would call a breakout. We need to spend sustained time above 46.37 um, in order to indicate a breakout there that has not happened yet. I don't expect that to happen. Um, and again, we have 48.19. So Eventually, a move through 46.37 is going to take us to 48.19. Um, underneath the market, primary, what I would call tactical support is at 45.41. It's about 100 points lower than where we are right now. That's the September, September 1st high. Let's go to number two, market internals. The Asbury 6 remains positive as of November the 2nd. So here is the Asbury 6 through yesterday, December the 12th. <clears throat> the Asbury 6 is, uh, is Asbury Research's own in-house model that tells us what the daily health of the market is underneath the hood of the market. The reason we built this years ago was because of the added volatility in the S&P 500 really over the past five years or so, there's a lot more computerized trading. There's a lot more algorithmic trading going on. And 
what happens is, you know, the result of that, I believe, is you're getting a lot more uh, moves during the day that really don't mean anything within the context of the bigger trend. How many times have we walked in in the morning and the S&P 500 is down 50 and we're bullish and we've got charts and research to make us feel, feel very comfortable about being bullish. We see the market down 50, the S&P down 50, and we start scratching our chin wondering if we made a mistake. The next day, the market's down another 40. So now we're getting out of our well-planned idea to be long. Three days later, the market turns around and is making new highs. The Asbury 6 is meant to keep us from doing that. So the Asbury 6 actually turned to positive as four or more of the individual constituent metrics of the Asbury 6 are necessary for a directional trend. So four of these um, turned green or turned to positive um, on November the 2nd. Um, since then, the S&P 500 has risen by 8%. We've done some historical backtesting on the Asbury 6, and uh, we actually backtested it with kind of an incremental approach where each time or each instance where six of the Asbury 6 are all green, that's 100% invested. If there's only three green, 50% invested. Um, if there's only one green, you're one sixth invested. Just to try to learn what the veracity of the indicator is. And what we found is that it sticks like glue to the S&P 500 most of the time while cutting the risk in half. Like the maximum drawdown the S&P 500 during the seven year period that we did the back test was 39%. Following the Asbury 6 in that manner was 14. So the point is these indicators are very important indications of what the real health of the market is. And right now they're all positive. So what does that mean? Stay with your longs. We're testing important resistance here at 4,600, but until th that test starts to fail to the point where we see the Asbury 6 start to turn red, you stay long. Why? Because the Asbury 6 is telling us the market is still internally healthy. We update this every day about two hours after the close. It's updated at Asbury Research's Research Center. And again, this is still positive. So number three, sector rotation. The CEF model follows the money in market sectors. CEF is an acronym. It stands for Sector ETF Asset Flows. It's another Asbury Research in-house model. I built this model probably close to 10 years ago now because sector rotation started to speed up. Again, there's a lot more computerized trading. There's, uh, I've read um, um, in the internet, various accounts in the internet where um, algorithmic trading, computerized trading is 80% of the daily volume. Uh, so it gets, it gets faster and it gets noisier. So what we did is we built a model for sector rotation that rather than following the relative performance charts of these 11 sectors versus the S&P 500. I built, a method, I built a methodology that tracks the velocity of money moving in and out of the 11 sectors of the S&P 500. And we do it in three different time frames. <clears throat> Excuse me. We do it in trading, which is a week, tactical, which is one month, and strategic, which is one quarter. And then we rank them. For example, here, this is our, our latest update. This is updated on the weekends on Saturday based on the acid flows from the previous week. So this one is our latest. It's through the end of last week. And it shows that through the end of last week in the fastest category, the trading category, the fastest um, velocity of money that was moving in um, was going into number one, consumer discretionary, and, and number two, uh, communication services. The fastest money that was moving out during that one week period was out of financials and out of energy. So then we add all of those scores up and anything from three to 15 is favored. So you can see the top three heading into this week, technology, XLK, consumer discretionary, XLY, and communication services, XLC. And you can see the ones to avoid down at the bottom are healthcare, energy, and 
staples as they all have an avoid ranking of 25 to 33. So we're staying away from these three in the bottom and we're putting our money towards these three at the top. All we're doing is following the money. We're not trying to calculate what the Fed's going to do or what um, um, Jerome Powell's going to say this afternoon or how the election's going to turn out. All we're doing is following the money. We want to be where the money is. Number four, more sector rotation. Our rainbow charts show the recent asset flows to technology. So what we've done is we've built charts. We call them rainbow charts for obvious reason. It looks like a rainbow. What we have on the top is the weekly rankings. And we do this for all 11 sectors. The weekly rankings, according to the CIF model, if they're favored, they're up here in green. If they're neutral, they're in yellow. And if they're avoid, they're in red. So what I'm pointing out here, just so you can get a visual of the relationship between the CIF model rankings and the market itself. Down here, we have a relative performance chart in the lower panel of XLK versus the S&P 500. So we use SPY. So we're going ETF to ETF. It's XLK relative to SPY. And what we can see is the CIF model went um, to a favored status for technology on October the 9th. Um, we had a little bit of a dip here, which you can see there's a little dip there to correspond to it. But overall, since October the 9th, um, it's for the most part been in a favored ranking. And meanwhile, the XLK has outperformed SPY by 4%. There is a um, cause and effect relationship between how much of that sector money um, that all together is the S&P 500 how much of that is going into each sector. You can see it back here again earlier this year. From January 9th to April 5th, uh, technology stayed in favored status that whole time. It came and tested the very top of the neutral category once or twice, but it stayed there. During that period, look at that outperformance. It outperformed XLK, outperformed SPY, or technology outperformed the S&P 500 by 10%. So I just wanted to show you the cause and effect of uh, what happens when you follow the money around the 11 sector spiders. There's more information on this if you go to asburyresearch.com and go to models and then go down to the CIF model. There's a lot more information there, charts and statistics, if you're interested in learning more. But for now, let's move to number five, market breadth, current extremes warn of a market top. So what we have the S&P 500 here on the top panel going back to fourth quarter of 2021. Down in the bottom is the percentage of NYSC stocks trading above their 40-day moving average. So what we're showing here is right now, 71% of those stocks are trading um, up above their 40-day moving average. It means that breath is getting frothy. Historically, breath is getting frothy. The last one, two, three, four, five, six times that that happened, here's July 13th. Uh, the market actually peaked a couple of weeks later on July the 27th, maybe about 10 days later. Here's February 1st. Here's November 29th of last year, August 15th of last year. Um, and here's um, March of last year, March of uh, 2022. And finally, November of 2021, it took a little bit for that top to finally emerge, but it ended up being a very major top. You know, this, this was the all-time high here that took place in early January of 2022. So what does that mean? Is it a sell signal? No, it's an environmental signal that tells you strategically we're probably at some kind of a similar peak now within the next few weeks. It resonates with me because 4,600 such an important resistance level for the S&P 500. So what's the trigger? We need to see some internal weakness. We need to see the S&P 5, or, or uh, rather we need to see the Asbury 6 start to turn red. We need to see um, that internal weakness. It isn't there right now. When it shows up, the likelihood that we're at some kind of an important top and we may see a month or two where the market goes lower, I think is very high. But again, we need those internals to start to turn red before this becomes actionable. So there it is. The
These are my five most important and influential market metrics to watch according to Asbury Research's data-driven approach to stock market investing. They collectively suggest that although the current October advance is still healthy and intact, according to the Asbury 6, downside risk now appears to exceed further upside reward as we head into the early part of next year. You can get a copy of this PDF um, by contacting us via the contact tab at asburyresearch.com. If you like my approach to investing, you can get more research and podcasts just like this one by visiting Asbury Research's YouTube channel and subscribing there. Thanks for watching. Have a wonderful holiday season with your families. And I'll be here once again in just about a month with another Your Daily Five via stockcharts.com.